Welcome to Unit 2. Over the next four weeks, we'll be studying how life perpetuates. In other words, this is our genetics unit. In this video, which is the first of two for the week, we'll talk about Chapter 7, DNA Structure and Replication. In this chapter, your book uh, answers these four driving questions like normal. In this video, I'm going to focus a lot on the structure and organization of DNA in cells and DNA replication, uh, but I'm going to leave the forensic stuff um, here and in these other two questions to your book. So DNA is the molecule of heredity, and we'll talk about what that means. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. That is a mouthful and you don't need to remember it. I just want you to know it in case you want to, but DNA, it's this molecule of heredity. DNA, alongside uh, the other nucleic acid, RNA, they're my favorite of the macromolecules, and it has to do with this term, molecule of heredity. So let's talk about what in the heck that means. So DNA is a very physical molecule. Like all physical molecules, all matter, it's made of atoms. It's made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, Nitrogen and phosphorus are the atoms that make up DNA. It's something very tangible, and if you have the right know-how, and this is something that you can Google, you can actually extract DNA just with household uh, products at home, um, and you can get that DNA out of bananas or strawberries or whatever cells that you can mash up and see it. You can look at it and touch it. It's kind of gooey, neat. But from this very tangible molecule, you can get abstract information. That's pretty neat. And the way that organisms have evolved to pass this information uh, through generations on this physical molecule is just fascinating to me. But to understand how information, this abstract information, is read from the tangible molecule of DNA, we've got to understand how DNA is structured. Uh, we've talked about a little bit before that DNA is stored in chromosomes. Prokaryotes, bacteria, and archaea, they have circular chromosomes. Since they don't have nuclei, it's just floating around in their cytoplasm. Eukaryotes like us and like plants and fungi and, you know, amoebas, we all have linear chromosomes and it's stored in our nucleus. It, or they, they're, we usually have a lot of chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs, which you can see uh, here in this karyotype right here. The book talks about it. Now, an organism as large and complex as a human has a lot of genes, a lot of DNA. Uh, the human genome, if you take all of the nuclear DNA and line it up, that's 3 billion of these bases. 3 billion with a B. That is a lot of DNA. And each of our cells have all of our DNA in them, with a few exceptions. We've talked about red blood cells. They don't have a nucleus at all, so they don't have any DNA in them. Uh, and in chapter 11, we'll talk about gametes, so they only have half of the genome. But otherwise, skin cells, brain cells, liver cells, all have the entire human genome within them. So those cells have to pack those three billion bases into a little nucleus. And the way they do this, uh, is by wrapping DNA up around proteins. So you have this DNA strand. This diagram is pretty good. Um, we'll look at that a little bit closer up in the next slide. That single strand of DNA uh, is wrapped around proteins called histones. This thing that I just circled is a bundle of histones which are wrapped around, or have DNA wrapped around them, rather, and they're bundled up to form a larger structure called a nucleosome. So you have a strand of DNA wrapped, it wraps twice around each histone, and then those histones are kind of twisted and wrapped up to form these nucleosomes. They look a lot like uh, pearls on a necklace. That's what chromatin is. Chromatin is the structure that DNA is in through most of a cell's life, which is when it's just resting, it's not dividing, it's going through and it's a misnomer to call it the resting phase. We'll talk about that. Um, but it, it's not dividing. It's going through its normal activities. 
Uh, and as we'll see in the next video, it needs to access that DNA to make proteins to get to the genes. So it doesn't want it, the DNA bundled up too much. But when it goes to divide, when a cell needs to divide, it replicates all its DNA and then packs it up even tighter into a condensed chromosome. And it does that by rewinding around histones, winding those histones up into these nucleosomes, winding nucleosomes into the spiral shape, and then winding that even more into this very large molecule called a condensed chromosome. So chromosome, depending on the scale you're talking about, can just be the shape linear or circular of the DNA, or it can be this very highly condensed, very, very large uh, molecule. And these are uh, what you see in these karyotypes. I don't know if any of you have ever seen your own karyotype, um, but they're pretty neat. And those are these highly condensed structures. Okay, at a smaller scale, if we zoom in on just one strand of DNA, we can look at these structures uh, called nucleotides. As you probably should remember, Nucleotides are the monomer for nucleic acids. It's one subunit. Each of these subunits, each of these nucleotides, is made up of a base, which is shown right here, uh, a sugar. Notice that this sugar is a pentagon instead of a hexagon. It's ribose, not glucose. So it's a little bit different sugar. And in fact, in DNA, it's deoxyribose. It's just missing one oxygen compared to ribonucleic acid, which is what RNA is. Don't worry about that. But there's a sugar in there, and there's also this phosphate group shown in white right here. The sugar and the phosphate um, form the backbone. And there are four different bases. So here you see this sugar, phosphate, backbone, and the uh, bases in the middle. So the four bases are these A's, A's P's, C's, and G's that I'm sure you've seen. You're, you'll see them again. Um, so we've got adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These have some very important properties. Okay, so these different uh, bases are chemically similar to one other base, and so they form complementary pairs. Uh, adenine always is uh, complementary to thymine, and guanine is also always the complement to cytosine. And this is because if you look really closely in this diagram, you see these dotted lines. There are two between the A's and the T's, and three between the C's and the G's. Those represent hydrogen bonds. Now, if you remember from chapter two, when we were looking at water, a hydrogen bond is an interaction between uh, the different areas, differently partially charged areas of polar molecules. So these hydrogen bonds are not as strong as a covalent bond or even an ionic bond. They're sort of weak, but it does hold the two sides of this DNA strand together. That ability for it to be held together but not so strong that it can't be broken is very important when we talk about DNA replication uh, and also when we talk about gene expression in Chapter 8 in the next video. I like to think of DNA with an, an analogy. Okay, So you've got your two bases together in the middle. These are like steps on a staircase. All right, So they're horizontal if you are thinking about it in the terms of this analogy. And then the interactions of the sugar phosphate backbone form a spiral shape. So this is a spiral staircase. Uh, that spiral shape with the two strands is called a double helix. I imagine you've heard that term before, but that's all it means is it's a spiral with two strands going along it. So if you think of DNA, one strand of DNA as a spiral staircase, and you're going up that spiral staircase, you're stepping on the bases, and the handrails are the sugar phosphate backbone. That helps me remember what's going on. Now, the basic molecular structure here of DNA is very important, so if you feel like you need extra practice with it, there's a link to a website in the transcript, in the PDF, uh, and it's from nobelprize.org. It's very good. It's a game that you can play uh, just to get some more practice with figuring out like where each of these things go, uh, which base bonds with which base, and so forth. So in order to reproduce or to divide, 
a cell needs to copy its DNA. It's called DNA replication. And this is semi-conservative, which your book talks about. What this means is that in a new DNA strand, one of the sides, one strand is from an old strand. So if you've got, here I'm gonna make it not a helix because of my lack of artistic skills. This is a double-stranded DNA string um, and it's going to divide. So one of these strands will be used as a template for a new DNA molecule and the other strand will be new nucleotides that uh, are brought in through some enzyme um, actions. So that's what we mean by semi-conservative. Same thing happens over here too, by the way. We all have one old strand and one new strand. So there's a template strand and a new strand in each of the uh, replications. That's all semi-conservative means. Uh, so there are several enzymes involved in DNA replication, which is important. Uh, some examples are DNA helicase, which is called helicase because it like unwinds the helix and unzips uh, those hydrogen bonds. And then you've got DNA polymerase, and there are several of these. We'll use that word again, so I just wanted to get you familiar with it. Um, polymerase is an enzyme that adds on monomers to form a polymer. Polymerase, pretty easy to remember. These um, are enzymes, of course, and enzymes are pretty good, but not perfect. They sometimes make mistakes uh, when the, the strand, I'm going to draw on this one over here again, when it is being uh, replicated, and let's say it moves up here a little bit, there are new nucleotides being brought in for this new strand as this DNA polymerase reads the template strand and it just adds on new nucleotides to this darker blue strand. Sometimes it makes mistakes. These are called mutations. Uh, there are different types of mutations that can happen. An insertion is when uh, the polymerase adds an extra base that doesn't need to be there. And a, a deletion is when it takes one out that doesn't need to be there. Those two end up with uh, the new strand being a different length than the old strand. That happens. You get just like this little loopy bubble on the DNA strand. Uh, can be good or bad. You can also have substitutions, which is when the polymerase just adds the wrong base. So you, and maybe it tries to add a cytosine where there's an adenine on the template. Instead of adding thiamine, it added cytosine. That can happen. And there can be replications, which is where um, longer strands, it's, it's like a long insertion. And it's just like the same base or the same two bases maybe are added um, in a row. So these are those short tandem repeats that your book talks about. That's how those happen. Now these can change the protein shape. This is going to be uh, a very important concept for the rest of this unit. So mutations change the protein shape. I'll tell you how in the next video. And that can be good or bad. We'll talk about those as well. But in any case, they are the source of genetic variation, which is extremely important for our next unit, which is evolution. So we'll come back to this idea several times. And just one spoiler alert, if an error in DNA replication results in a mutation that changes the protein shape and the molecules responsible for replicating DNA are themselves proteins, remember that enzymes are proteins, then we can have some serious problems that occur. We'll talk about that in chapter 10. I know that was very, very brief, but my hope is that you understand a few basic things. I hope you understand what DNA is made of uh, and how these different nucleotides work uh, and which three pieces that they're made up of, that base, sugar, and phosphate. So at a very small scale, I want you to understand how DNA is structured. And I also want you to understand how it winds up into this helix shape and how that helix, that double helix, uh, gets wound and rewound and wrapped around proteins and wound some more to form these large chromosomes. And uh, also, that DNA replication is semi-conservative. What that means, it's 
uh, assisted by enzymes and how that can result in mutations and from their genetic variation. From here, please read chapter eight and watch the lecture 5.2 video, which is over that chapter. And don't forget to be writing your annotated bibliography entries. All right, I'll see you in a few minutes, probably.